Before we get started, we just want to thank you for checking out all of the updates on Disappeared Season 2. If you haven't already had the opportunity to watch Season 1, or any of the other episodes from Season 2, don't worry, there'll be a playlist at the end. And if you're watching this video at a later date, that playlist will have all of the following episodes that we release on Wednesdays. So make sure that you're subscribed and you've got that bell icon turned on to all notifications. And with that, let's get started. John Glasgow was Chief Financial Officer of CDI Contractors, LLC, a company that built and remodeled many of Dillard's 300-plus department stores and put up some of Arkansas's signature projects, including former President Bill Clinton's library and the headquarters of Heifer International. He was last seen the morning of January 28, 2008, leaving his Little Rock, Arkansas home and his vehicle was later seen by tourists at Mar Lodge on Petit Jean Mountain. Almost no information surfaced for a full three years, and in 2011, the 45-year-old was declared dead. But that same year, a twice-convicted felon named Jonathan Bronner told his lawyer in the Little Rock Police Department that he knew where Glasgow's body was buried because he had been recruited by local thugs from Malvern, to whom he owed money to help bury Glasgow in a bean field near England in Lenoak County. But when the bean field was searched, no remains were found, and the investigation was forced to return to square one for nearly four more years. But finally, in 2015, a full seven years from the date he was last seen, first the skull of John Glasgow, and later more bone fragments and skeletal remains, were found on Petit Jean Mountain, less than a mile from where his vehicle was last seen. Dental records confirmed it was John, but the manner of death unfortunately remains undetermined in the medical examiner's report. Sheriff Mike Smith has said the case will remain open. The Jameson family of Eufaula, Oklahoma, consisting of husband Bobby, his wife Cheryl Lynn, and their daughter Madison, mysteriously disappeared on October 8, 2009. At the time of their disappearance, it was reported that they were considering purchasing a 40-acre plot of land near Red Oak, about 30 miles from their home. Almost immediately, when the investigation began, it became apparent that they had not disappeared on their own accord. The Jameson's pickup truck was discovered within a few days abandoned in Latimer County, a short distance south of the town of Quinta. Although the Jameson's bodies had not been discovered, their malnourished dog was still in the truck. Investigators also discovered the Jameson's IDs, wallets, mobile phones, a GPS system, and approximately $32,000 in cash. And although it was initially suspicious, it became apparent that the Jamesons were known for carrying large amounts of cash on hand. Several theories emerged about the family's disappearance, such as they had faked their own deaths, were in witness protection, had died in a group suicide, or the most obvious of all, they had been murdered. Lending credibility to that theory, Bobby Jameson had been involved in a bitter lawsuit with his father, Bob Dean Jameson, shortly before they disappeared, with Bobby claiming that Bob Dean, his father, had threatened his family. He also stated that his father had struck him with his vehicle on November 1st, 2008, and was involved with gangs and methamphetamine. Despite this, police do not believe that Bobby's father was involved in the family's disappearance. Unfortunately, in November of 2013, their suspected remains were found, and by July 3rd of the following year, the Oklahoma medical examiner had positively ID'd that it was the family. No cause of death had been determined, and the circumstances surrounding their disappearance still remain unknown.
September 28, 2004, seemed to begin as a normal day for Butler, New Jersey resident Tim Carney, as he began his journey into work at the Elizabeth Department of Labor. But that's where the normality would end, as he never made it into work that day, and appeared to vanish into thin air. His car was found four days later at a Newark, New Jersey intersection, and records show Tim made one final bank withdrawal of $1,000 a few days after that. Family and friends could not imagine why he would want to run away, but strangely believed it may be due to his involvement in a controversial local church called Gospel Outreach, whom Tim had seemingly become more and more committed to over the previous years, and had apparently become torn over his commitment to the church and his devotion to his family. His mother claims Tim no longer had his own thoughts and was being controlled by the group, saying he would often quote them and that she felt they were trying to take him away from his family. Tim's sister claims the group would often tell Tim, this is your family now. A former Butler detective spent hundreds of hours investigating the case, attempting to ask Gospel Outreach Pastor Jim Lethbridge about Tim's whereabouts. But the pastor called police and said he was being harassed. Lethbridge would later accuse ex-members of the church, along with critics, of knowing Tim Carney's whereabouts and hiding him. Tim's family spent thousands of dollars looking for him, on everything from a billboard, to private investigators, to psychics. And this story would have a bittersweet ending, as Tim Carney was finally located and spoken with in September of 2011. But he did not want to contact his family or disclose his whereabouts. The prosecutor's office did respect Carney's wishes, but chose to at least notify the Carney family he was alive and well. And on September 23rd of 2011, Tim Carney was removed from the missing persons database. Jeremy Carl Burt has been missing from Boise, Idaho since February 11th, 2007. He was last seen on the 2200 block of Harvey Street at 10.30 p.m. when he dropped his daughter off at his father's house and said that he was en route to a friend's home, but never arrived. It was shortly after leaving that his ex-wife, Kim George, received a text message from Bert's phone stating that he planned to disappear and was moving to a new address as well as getting a new life. But this was not like Bert. For more than one reason. Bert was a man with a beautiful daughter, and he worked very closely with his ex wife in order to raise her in a positive environment. They were so close, in fact, that prior to his disappearance, they were considering getting married again. So when she received this text message, not only was it out of character, the context and wording were nothing like the way that Bert would behave and both Bert's mother and father were inclined to agree. Shortly after his disappearance, his ex-wife Kim returned home from her trip, and she was even more upset to find that her car had been missing and filed a stolen vehicle report. But because of the messages, it made it difficult for him to be labeled a missing person. Three months later in May, after Jeremy was last seen, Police found Kim's car in a remote area more than a hundred miles away from Boise, near the Nevada state line. Her car had been completely burned out in a ravine, but detectives found that it was strange because it would have been difficult terrain for the car to have driven on. At the time of his disappearance, Bert was living with his father and his daughter, and after divorcing his wife Kim George, he had an affair with his attorney, Jean Braun, and taped recorded conversations with her about the illegal activity that she had been involved in. His relationship with Braun came to an end when he testified against her before a grand jury in 2004 for her illegal activity. Braun was sentenced to one year in jail and 14 years of probation after entering a guilty plea for forging a judge's signature as well as influencing a witness. But despite the motive, no evidence has come to light in this case, and it still remains unsolved. Unfortunately, in July of 2016, 
his ex-wife Kim George, who had remarried in the years following his disappearance, also passed away of an apparent suicide. But their daughter Mackenzie, who was three years old when her father went missing, is happily living with her stepfather, and according to reports, is doing very well in school. Cameras caught Kara Kopetsky walking out of Belton High School in Kansas City one day back in 2007, and she was never seen or heard from again. The only lead investigators were able to follow up on was a protective order Kara had filed on her then-boyfriend Kyler Eust, whom Kara said had both kidnapped her and had begun abusing her, and she said the abuse had gotten so bad she was unsure of what he might do next. But nothing would come of the lead, and it would be a long ten years for the Kopetsky family as they waited for justice for their daughter. The wheels of justice would begin to spin on September 9th of 2016, when 21-year-old Jessica Runyons would leave a party with a man and vanish. Early the next morning, her car was found burned in a desolate, wooded area, and Jessica was nowhere to be found. Jessica's disappearance was reported by her boyfriend, and friends told police that the man seen leaving the party with Jessica was her boyfriend's longtime friend, none other than Kyler Eust. Upon looking up Kyler Eust online, Jessica's mother would call Karis, and the two formed a friendship based on the common understanding of the awful pain associated with losing a child, later saying, quote, we've become a family. A friend contacted police that he had driven Eust home that night and that Eust was recovering from burns he had received upon setting Runyon's SUV on fire. Eust was arrested the next day and investigators noted he did have burns on his face, arms, and hands, as well as scratches on his face. Eust was only able to be charged for the fire at first, but eventually confessed to strangling and killing Kara and Jessica and hiding their bodies a claim he had actually made to many people before it turned out, including a bandmate, roommate, and a couple of ex-girlfriends, among others. The majority of these people had called police upon hearing Use confession, but charges hadn't been able to be filed until Use confessed to the murders himself to investigators. On April 4th, months after Use's arrest the previous September, a mushroom hunter contacted police that he had discovered two sets of human remains in heavy woods near the 4 Highway and 233rd Street. DNA and dental records identified their remains as Kara Kopetsky and Jessica Runyon's. A push for new DNA testing has delayed Kyler Use's murder trial, and as of December 2019, no trial date has been set.